Welcome to my YouTube channel. My guest on Facing the Canon is Peter Saunders, a medical doctor making a difference around the world. Dr. Peter Saunders, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you. I'm delighted to have you on the program, Peter. You trained as a doctor in New Zealand. What did you do then? Well, I grew up in New Zealand. My, my dad was a, uh, a lay preacher and a businessman. My mother was a nurse and I went to med school, medical school with my best friend. Specialised in general surgery after finishing at Auckland. So I did an Australasian fellowship. Uh, got married, uh, had a couple of children, and then after we'd finished our specialist training, we left New Zealand in early 89 and went on to uh, work with the Africa Inland Mission in Kenya in a little mission hospital called Kapsua in the Western Highlands. And that was on en route to coming to the UK to spend a couple of years at the All Nations uh, Christian College for missionary training. And, and your wife, a paediatrician. Yeah. So yep. in Kenya, tell us a little bit, what was life like for you? Initially, was it a slight culture shock for you, moving from New Zealand? Well, it's an interesting question. I think it was a much bigger culture shock coming from Kenya to England than it was going from New, really? Zealand, New Zealand to Kenya. And I, I think, because you expect Kenya to be so much different, and yet actually we found it quite easy to adjust. It was a it was a well organised hospital. The the work was very stimulating. There was lots of it to do, and it, we really got into it very quickly and well. So there was certainly I, I think probably most of the adjustments were were slowing down to a more African way of life. In Swahili, they have three proverbs: haraka, haraka, haina baraka, which means uh, in hurrying there's no blessing. Boli boli and Dion Wendo, which means slowly, slowly, this indeed is the right way to live. And then there's Labda Kesho, Lakini Labda Kesho Kutwa, which means maybe tomorrow, but then again, maybe the day after tomorrow. So there was a huge change in, <laughs> in pace. And of course, we didn't have the same technology lab uh, IT backup that we had at home, but we were able to do fairly sophisticated surgery there. And it was very, very general you had to turn your hand really to whatever came through the door. So it was very, very challenging. Uh, I was learning uh, some things from books and applying skills across a wider range uh, of things and then uh, just gradually getting used to the challenges that we had. But it was an incredibly stimulating and enjoyable time. My wife worked in the paediatric ward. I did the surgery and then there were two English doctors who did the general practice and the internal medicine and uh, all the rest of the team were Kenyan nationals. The Lord guides our steps and he guides our stops. And obviously you felt it was time to move on and go to All Nations Christian College. What was that like after being in Kenya, ministering, and now you and your wife, your students again? Well, we were keen to go there anyway, because we felt that God was calling us long-term to be quote unquote career missionaries in the developing world. And we'd been advised by a former uh, medical missionary in New Zealand to get some experience before we went to a training college so that we really knew what the questions were. And that was fantastic advice. So we were about a year in Kenya, then we were going on to all nations and to our mind, we were going back to Africa long-term after that. And uh, as you say, uh, well, God, God's word is a light to our path, yes. but not our horizon. We, we know that we know the distant future is secure, but we don't know what God has for us in the future. And the path that he had mapped out for us was very different from, from what we had envisioned. But we arrived in the UK in uh, September 1989. So if you know your history, folks, it was just before the Berlin Wall came down, all yes. the extraordinary changes in Eastern Europe. So there we were with 170 students from 40 countries, 
all wanting to do cross-cultural mission abroad, training there. And we're, we're in this college learning about mission and all of these amazing things are happening around us. And the Holy Spirit is rewriting and redrawing the maps of the world. And, and suddenly vast areas like the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe were opening up in a way that they never had been before. So it was an extraordinary time to be there and a time to have deep questioning about, you know, how can we be most strategic going forward too? Absolutely. But you're obviously, we're not guided back to Africa, in, but you were guided in another direction. What happened then? Well, when we, when we left New Zealand, it was, there were a lot of uh, cords that were cut, if you like. So, you know, we left home, family, church, friends, career, all of those things. We thought that those were big steps, but there was a sense in going to Africa to do mission that it was pretty much of an adventure as well. And I think the cost was probably greater for you know our parents and those we left behind taking their only grandchildren abroad than it was for us. But when we got to All Nations, and I think two years with mission-minded folk, studying the scriptures, looking at the world change, asking deep questions about what God wants. And, and I started to sense that he was calling me out of medicine. And that was extremely uncomfortable to start with. And uh, in a sense, we felt we'd cut all the strings. But then for me, there were three remaining ones. I didn't want to leave medicine. I didn't want to give up my dream of working in the developing world as missionary doctors together. And I certainly did not want to live in England. <laughs> <laughs> because of the weather. <laughs> well, for all, all, all sorts of, all sorts all of sorts reasons. Of reasons. Yeah. Yes. But, um, and, and yet that was where he was leading us. Because while we're at All Nations, he really opened up our eyes, I think, to the opportunities for cross-cultural mission in the West and in Europe, and in a way that we'd never seen it before. And we started to see that God was bringing people from every nation under the sun to the cities and the universities and the hospitals and the medical schools of Europe. And that therefore these places were like open doors or little Antiochs, if you like, back into every part of the world. And so I started to see just how strategic students, medical students in my field were, and how strategic doctors from other countries were, and many of them were coming to train in the UK. And so there was a series of steps really where I began to wonder whether my future was in clinical medicine. And to cut a long story short, he called me out of clinical medicine, out of surgery at that point, into full-time student ministry. So it was over a period of two years at the college of thinking and praying through all of that. So. I stepped out of All Nations into a role as head of student ministries at the Christian Medical Fellowship in the UK. And, uh, and I ended up doing that for quite some time. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, and then different roles out. within that as well. That's right. So yes. I, was, I was head of student ministries for eight years. And then uh, the CEO left at that point. And uh, people were nudging me to apply for that position. I wasn't that keen because I was really enjoying the student, the student work. And I, I think when I took on the student job, finally understanding what it was all about, it was like treasure in a field to me. You know, I, I really felt I'd give up everything to do it because it was such an amazing opportunity. But then when the CEO role came up, it was much more like, let this cup pass from me. Yes. I did not really want that at all because I was very happy with what I was doing. So there was a, a little bit of wrestling there around the millennium, but eventually I um, uh, surrendered <laughs> and uh, took on that role. And actually I, after doing the student work for eight years, I ended up being CEO for 19 yes. years uh, up until just three years ago. So Christian Medical Fellowship, Peter, what is it? What does it do? Well, essentially, it's there to, to equip Christian doctors and nurses to live and to speak for Jesus Christ in all areas of their life, whether it's family or work or uh, you know, community or, or whatever. And so it brings together about 4,000 doctors, about 300 nurses, 
and about a thousand medical students uh, from all over the the UK. So we're talking about 40 odd medical schools and all the hospitals and GP surgeries. So about half of the members would have been general practitioners and the rest hospital. Peter, I mean, that's wonderful when you think the number of, of doctors and nurses that you're able to influence. I, I think of a church leader who may have a congregation of 100 and yet the potential here to influence was huge. I think it is. And if you think many more people will go through the doors of a doctor's surgery or hospital than will ever go through the doors of a church. And so doctors and, and nurses are in a unique position, really, to be able to have contact with a vast number of different people. And, and often at times in their lives when they're really asking deep questions as well. So we see them as a strategic people group, if you like, in world mission, that, um, that they're, they're folk who need to be, like every member of the church, equipped to be able to share their faith and to be able to live out their faith and Christian values uh, as salt and light in the marketplace, as tent makers like Paul, if you like, raising their own support, but being God's presence in society. So obviously you were a bit like a pastor to them, uh, encouraging them, equipping them, but I can imagine helping them to navigate some huge landmines. What kind of advice were you able to say, give to your doctors in your fellowship when it came to an issue like abortion? Because the doctor is in an awkward position there so how were you able to advise them? Well, I, I think the thing about Christian Medical Fellowship is that it really was a fellowship in the sense that we had an extraordinary range of ability and giftedness and knowledge across lots of specialties as well. So people were able to encourage and build one another up and help one another. I was uh, probably more just trying to orchestrate and facilitate that whole process. But in helping doctors and nurses, uh, first of all, there's, there's uh, being a witness to their patients and their colleagues. And then there's living out their faith uh, and showing the character of Christ and what they do. But then, uh, as, as you say, there's negotiating all these difficult ethical issues. You know, how do you deal with uh, abortion or euthanasia or transgender or truth-telling and confidentiality in a Christian context. So it was helping them to think about those things, but also thinking about world mission in a medical context and the fact that, that medicine and nursing really do open doors to places around the world where you cannot get just as an evangelist or, or pastor or, or church planter. And so that there's a responsibility too that's much wider uh, geographically in God's world to, you know, to go. To, to places. Absolutely. But, but these issues, Peter, that you have just mentioned, we're all having to work out how do we navigate responding to these issues that might be affecting our family or our neighbours or our community. How do we today respond to the currents in our society and not be overwhelmed by them? Well, I think it was John Stott who used to talk about double listening. He said, we've got to listen to the word of God and also to the world of God and bring the two together. So the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other, if you like. And so we have to integrate our faith with the world in which we live. And I think the temptations for Christians in the world are are first of all to escape to our little Christian ghettos and not engage at all. Uh, and, or the other temptation is just to blend in and uh, run with the current and not be like anybody else because it's much easier that way. But I, I think what God calls us to do is first of all to be engaged in society. As Jeremiah said, you know, become part of the, of the city in which, you've, in which you live. Seek its good. 
uh, so what we're called to engage and be engaged in every aspect of society and trying to be salt and light. But then on the other hand, we're called to be distinctive, like the, the, the prophet Daniel and his friends who, who reached a very high position in, in Babylon and served it for its good, but they were also, they had to make some pretty tough decisions when they were uh, coerced or um, you know, directed in ways that they, they felt they could not go as believers. So I, I think it's this distinctiveness on the one hand and engagement on the other. And I guess that's the challenge for Christian doctors and nurses to be, to be both salt and light and yet um, be um, you know, engaged. And I think so. today, Peter, would you not agree that there seems to be an anti-Christian bias at the moment? And it's almost like we can't, anything we say, we're shot down. And it's very, very difficult. We feel like we're navigating, um, how do we tread carefully without treading on the eggshells? It feels like that, doesn't it? Well, we're, in the West, particularly, we're living in increasingly what is a post-Christian society. So it's a society that's absolutely saturated with the influence of Christianity. And so many of the good things that we have, our health systems, education, our whole system with government and so on, are profoundly influenced by Christian history and a Christian worldview. But now, increasingly, we're living in a post-Christian world where, where people have forgot where all the good things come from and increasingly it's it's an atheistic or secular humanist worldview that's dominating and the people in the corridors of power whether it's uh, a government or the law courts or the universities or in the areas of media arts and entertainment they're increasingly driven by a worldview that is not christian and in fact anti-christian and so that creates real pressure for us i, I think there's a there's a sense now in which we're living much more in Babylon than, than in, uh, in Jerusalem. And so we really need to know where we stand. We need to know our God. We need to know our gospel. We need to know uh, what he requires of us so that we can walk with obedience and be good witnesses in, in this world in which we're placed now. But in many ways, it's not any different from what Christians have faced all the way through history. And the church was born in a non-Christian world in the first century and grew and, and conquered. And Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And, and that's the way we've got to look at history is that God is absolutely sovereign and in control. And he's working out his plan of gathering people from every nation under the sun unto, into his kingdom uh, and ultimately to herald in the return of Christ and the new heaven and the new earth. So you know, we, don't, we don't lose hope, but we, we're not surprised to face real difficulty and uh, not, not surprised that there's opposition, particularly in what, as I've said, is a, a post-Christian or perhaps even an end-stage culture in which we're living today. That's so, so encouraging to hear and a good reminder, Peter, that actually the, the early church had opposition and throughout the centuries, there's been opposition. I suppose today with social media, everything seems magnified uh, and appears worse. And, and obviously the population is greater, but actually these battles have been going on for centuries, but uh, the Lord is still on the throne. Well, absolutely. And I think we get a, a very jaundiced and incorrect view of what's happening in the world from just watching the media or, or social media. When we step back and look at it from, from God's perspective of history, what we see is the church advancing and growing all over the world, more people becoming believers now than, they, than has ever been the case before. And God is fulfilling his plan and his promise that he gave Abraham right at the beginning that through him and through his seed Jesus Christ every nation would be blessed and touched and uh, we, we've got to keep our eyes on that goal and to know that however things look that God is in control and that he's working all things ultimately for the good and that there will be 
a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And we can look forward to that with great confidence and look to him in our weakness to be faithful in the present. Absolutely. You spent those years with the Christian Medical Fellowship and then you moved on into what? So I'm now with a group called the ICMDA, the International Christian Medical and Dental Association. And ICMDA is an umbrella body for all the Christian medical fellowships around the world. So there are over 80 countries in the world which have Christian medical fellowships or Christian medical associations like CMF that I worked with. And uh, ICMDA seeks to bring all of those together. And so I moved from CMF three years ago uh, into ICMDA. We're, we're quite a small organization. We just have five staff, uh, but we have 61 field workers, all of whom are tent makers. So they're, they're working either full or part time in medicine or dentistry in 14 different regions around the world. And our dream, our vision is a Christian witness through doctors and dentists in every community and in every nation. So it's a, you know, it's a, Matthew 28 wow. vision, but, but our aim is to start and to strengthen national associations of Christian doctors and dentists. So where they don't exist, we start them, where they do, we help to strengthen them. And so the core of our work really boils down to, to developing training and mentoring leaders, because that's the best way of starting and strengthening national movements. So our focus very much now is on um, developing Christian medical and dental leaders. So, so I'm now uh, working with ICMDA. In, in over 80 countries? Yeah. So that's hugely encouraging. It is, and it's, and it's growing. So uh, and of those 18, we have another, at our next World Congress, which is in 2023, we've got another 16 target nations who are moving towards affiliation where there are already national groups developing. Uh, we know of another 15 with, with national groups starting and then we've got Christian medical and dental contacts in at least another 30 or 40 countries. So uh, there's, there's growth happening all the time and, and the Lord just seems to raise up amazing individuals and brings them to our attention yes. and we, uh, we get in touch with them and are mutually encouraged and then see what we can do to establish these new national movements and, and particularly focusing on students and young leaders because they're the leaders of the of the future. You've produced a number of wonderful resources, Peter. I've been dipping into all of these resources and uh, books, booklets. I do like the booklets because you it's concise, it's clear, but tell us a, about some of these resources that you've produced? So we, we aim to produce literature and resources, particularly on issues at the interface of Christianity and medicine. So it's got to be both Christian and medical. And so we're filling a gap there, which isn't filled by the medical schools or the churches, it's that interface. So you've got there, that there's a book that I wrote called The Human Journey, which is on different eight chapters on different aspects of medicine and then a whole lot of little booklets on different ethical issues and uh, and uh, and so on living in living in society as a christian doctor but that's a, a small subset of what's available through the christian medical societies and fellowships around the world particularly the larger ones like the cmda in the us and the cmf in the uk as well and uh, so there are, there are books and journals, resources, blogs, and so on. So any, any subject that you're interested in at the interface of Christianity and of medicine and nursing, you can find things there. Of course, when COVID hit, uh, uh, our, our work changed completely because at ICMDA, it was very much built around running regional conferences or language-based conferences in different parts of the world and then funding field workers to travel into countries and of course those two things stopped being available so we had to we had to think well what are we going to do now and um, one of the first things we did was to start up a global webinar series and so we started doing a whole series of talks on COVID from a medical 
and Christian perspective. And then, of course, as the pandemic went on, we'd exhausted all those topics. And so we branched, we branched out. And so every Thursday at 2 p.m., we have a Christian doctor or dentist who will be broadcasting to, uh, we get audiences of usually about 80 to 150 doctors and dentists from 40 to 60 countries on, on average around the world. And we're, we're up to number 90 webinar now. So we've we just kept, kept going and we film everything. We put it up on our website, we make it available and things get a lot more hits on YouTube than they ever get live. So it's helped us to build up a great big variety of resources. And the other thing that we're really majoring on is what we call training tracks. So we started up, up with this small group learning, eight to 12 people from maybe six countries who come together on Zoom once a week uh, to, to hear a talk and answer questions initially. But then we filmed all the talks and we, we, we used the see one, do one, teach one principle whereby the trainees, after a 10 week course of this, then became the facilitators, but used the videos from the first course. So we started off with four 10 week training tracks, the next generation we had 10, and the next generation we had 23, and then we're now on to the, the next one. So we've had hundreds of young doctors and dentists from you know 30 or 40 Amen. countries uh, studying bioethics or evangelism and apologetics or leadership uh, and so on. Uh, so, so COVID has pushed us, like everyone, in directions that we would never have imagined, but it's been, I think, largely good for the fellowship. And now we're in the process of trying to adapt back to a, a life which is partly what we've learned in COVID and partly what we did before, more of a hybrid ministry. Peter, it, it's so encouraging and reassuring to know that these fellowships exist and that you exist to support doctors and dentists and nurses for the kingdom of Jesus and well done to you for all that you've done and all that you're doing and keep on keeping on. Thank you for joining us on Facing the Canon. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Isn't that encouraging? I, I'm just encouraged to hear of so many doctors in, and nurses and dentists in so many different countries all endeavouring to live for Christ in the calling that God has given them all. If you are a doctor, dentist, a nurse, then can I encourage you to look at the fellowships and consider becoming members of the fellowships and tapping into some of these incredible resources. Thank you for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again.